to this talk uh, on a terrific book, Citizenship and Its Discontent, uh, by Professor Jayal, who's going to um, uh, talk about the book uh, and its argument uh, for uh, 20 to 25 minutes. I'll make a brief comment afterwards, uh, and then we'll open it up to a, a more general discussion. So, Professor Jayal. Thank you very much. Thank you to the South Asia Institute for the invitation to Madhav Khosla, who has just entered the room for initiating the idea, uh, and to all who are present, thank you for being here. Um, so this book is um, an account of a century of disagreement over the idea of the Indian citizen, which is, in my view, the defining aspiration of modern India, but also its most contested political idea. And the book presents the story of Indian citizenship as one that straddles the 20th century. It shows how the dominant idea of citizenship is forged in the first half of the 20th century, uh, finds embodiment in the constitutional settlement at the exact midpoint of that century, and is simultaneously unraveled and strengthened in its second half. Now, my usage thus far probably suggests that uh, there was only one idea of citizenship at work, but the whole point of this exercise has been precisely the opposite, to highlight the plural and contending narratives across this vast span of time and on every dimension, or at least uh, three important dimensions of this complex idea. Um, in some areas, in fact, the contestations of the first half of the 20th century have proved to be so enduring that there are strong and striking similarities uh, in the debates and some of the arguments that are marshaled across this entire period. So the book is structured around uh, the three core dimensions of citizenship as I identify them. Citizenship as legal status, as rights and entitlements, and as identity. And obviously these, uh, there are others, but these are, to my mind, the core dimensions. And they obviously do not exist in self-contained uh, hermetically sealed um, silos, there are important intersections between them, and the book remarks on some of these intersections, though that obviously is a task um, that can be taken much further. Each of these three themes, um, status, rights, and identity, is further considered in three historical phases, with a chapter devoted to each phase, uh, one to the late colonial period, one to the period of the constitutional settlement, and one to the post-independence uh, period. Now, obviously, this is not a history of everything about the idea and the practice of citizenship, but it's a selective treatment of particular moments and issues. The constitutional settlement of 1950 is treated as central to the defining of the new idea of the, of the Indian citizen, but the book underscores, uh, perhaps exaggerates, but certainly underscores the fragility of this compact, which is, in my view, often and easily unsettled. In a sense, every major debate on citizenship the world over is currently being enacted in India in ways that are frequently contrary in argumentative terms as they call into question uh, the presumptions of many of these debates. Take citizenship as legal status, something we tend to take for granted, uh, and that political theorists have begun to interrogate this taken for grantedness only in the last 10 years or so, uh, particularly starting with Linda Bosniak's work. Across the world, a greater hybridization of legal citizenship is occurring. Even countries which historically adopted the ethnic descent-based model of citizenship like Germany are now moving towards a more inclusive, territorial, birth-based model, or at least incorporating elements of it. In India, however, we see a movement in reverse. From a more inclusive principle of legal citizenship, articulated in the Constitution to a less inclusive conception from a usoli or birth-based to an increasingly, if covertly, eusanguinous or descent-based principle. And the book shows how the tension between these two principles has been present, if dormant, since the founding of the Republic, and how the laws, the rules, and the jurisprudence on citizenship have come to be increasingly inflected by religious difference. So the laws of citizenship have been amended in the 1980s in response to the illegal 
migration, uh, within quotes, illegal, migration of several million Bangladeshi Muslims across <coughs> the eastern border. The modification of the Usoli conception by elements of Usanguinis, which is seen in this amendment, is also reflected in a more recent and curious enthusiasm uh, displayed by successive Indian governments over the last decade or so to accord a form of weak dual citizenship to the wealthy Indian diaspora. It is evident also, though less enthusiastically, in the state's response to the in-migration of Hindus from Pakistan in the West. I conducted field work amongst these communities of migrants on the western border in Jaisalmer and Jodhpur in Rajasthan, mostly Dalits and Adivasis who migrated from Pakistan through the 1990s and have been seeking citizenship. And it was striking that even as the government has inscribed their religious identity into the rules, not the act, uh, not the citizenship act itself, but the rules uh, that are appended to it, these people themselves repudiate all arguments of blood and belonging. What they understand by citizenship has little to do with identity or affect. It is almost entirely about the social rights to which, in their view, citizenship holds the key, from electricity connections to admission to government schools for their children, from caste certificates to access to subsidized food. That's what citizenship means to them. That, in their view, is what citizenship is for. And the fact that the migrants in Western India interpret citizenship in terms of rights echoes, of course, the historical association of citizenship with rights. And that is the subject of the second part of this book, where I track the troubled career of social and economic rights, which I will henceforth refer to as SERs, despite a fairly early articulation of such rights from the 1920s onwards, with the Congress party pledging its commitment, as many of you may be aware, to an impressive range of economic rights as early as 1931. However, the attempt to give them constitutional basis failed and SERs were placed in a section of the constitution that is unenforceable <coughs> in the courts. In the early decades after independence, such rights remained aspirational and unattainable, also because the social product was small, minuscule in fact. It is oddly enough in the context of neoliberal economic policy that social rights have received a fillip. With an explosion of rights in the last seven, eight years, rights to information, to work, to education, and most recently to food security, as recently as a week ago, uh, food security, though this is not a right. Now, though the impetus for these enactments of social and economic rights came from a combination of judicial activism and civil society mobilization, the old arguments about the cost of social rights, first heard in the Constituent Assembly, are once again being rehearsed. But I'll return to this in a bit. More importantly, and even ironically, the language of rights has emerged in the context of weakened class politics and become more strident as the state and capital become more rapacious, even audaciously rapacious, um, both separately and in partnership. Further, the moment of state acknowledgement that the nation can actually afford to help the poor coincides with the moment when the responsibility for social assistance has already been diffused among a multiplicity of agencies, often <coughs> non-state agencies. It is not at all clear what rights to public goods can mean in a policy context where the principles of the new public management reign supreme and public services are variously commodified, outsourced, and delivered by the seductively labeled public-private partnerships. So the central questions about the content of these new social rights remain. Are they universal? Are, they constitution, are, the, are the constitutional guarantees um, and, and the legal guarantees um, adequate for their realization? Is weak state capacity a real challenge to their implementation? And is the goal of social policy now any different than it was before? Is it now to actually mitigate social inequality? Or does it remain uh, that of simply alleviating the more extreme manifestations of poverty? The third and arguably most politically contentious aspect of the citizenship question in India is its project of balancing the multiplicity and the diversity of cultural identities, caste, 
language, tribe, religion, and so on, with the civic identity. Universalist and group differentiated conceptions of citizenship have struggled for supremacy in India for more than a century. And this is a very difficult contest because both these conceptions have indisputably a deep moral appeal. As we are all aware, universalism affirms the equality of all citizens, recognizes no gradations of citizenship, and within the framework of liberal neutrality, adopts different blind policies. Strategies of group differentiated citizenship, or GDC, are widely acknowledged as a normatively satisfactory solution for this concern that what is masquerading as universalism is actually a covert way of promoting the dominant culture, the dominant race, the dominant religion, whatever, in a society. And many years ago, Iris Marion Young powerfully formulated this principle, persuading us that group differentiated rights are a way of addressing oppression, which she defined as encompassing exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and vulnerability to violence motivated by hatred and fear. But in India, as elsewhere, it is almost exclusively claims based in cultural identity rather than other forms of exploitation or other forms of powerlessness and so on that have presented themselves as candidates for such rights. In fact, Indian political discourse and Indian policy discourse has added to the repertoire of Young's justifications a new, uh, if somewhat fuzzy, concept, that of backwardness. India was probably the first country in the world to have experimented as far back as the 1880s with policies that are today described as affirmative action or positive discrimination. Through the late colonial period, a variety of claims were articulated for GDC in the form of separate electorates and quotas. Underwriting this was a view which was shared by the colonial state and also by important sections of its subjects a view of Indian society as a community of communities. Citizenship came to be viewed as properly mediated by the community rather than as an unmediated relationship between the citizen and the state or the individual citizen and the state. The Congress Party's espousal of a universal conception of citizenship in the nationalist era was a determined attempt at constructing a modern state in which this could be an unmediated relationship within the framework of a nation which would be defined as a civic community and could as such accommodate diversity. In the late colonial period, the challenges, there were many challenges to this inclusionary universalist conception and they were not just many but also diverse, ranging from a sort of universalism espoused by the uh, by the Hindu nationalists, which was an exclusionary uh, type of universalism, to multiple other claims to group differentiated citizenship, whether as antidotes to religious majoritarianism or to um, caste discrimination and so on. And many of these have actually endured into the post-colonial period um, in one form or another and are often justified in almost identical terms as before. In this book, I explore the idea of backwardness in relation to two groups um, uh, to whom it is most typically applied, the scheduled tribes and the so-called other backward classes. Even as backwardness has acquired ever greater validation as a criterion of GDC, these categories as administrative constructs remain um, bedeviled by definitional ambiguities which increasingly um, tend to fuel conflicts over citizenship. The multiplication of demands, for instance, for subquotas for particularly disadvantaged groups, such as the most backward castes or MBCs, within already entitled beneficiary groups, represent a continuing challenge, which is officially met by programs to recount the population, such as the revival of the caste census, which we had abandoned in 1931, now, whether this can lead to a better calibration of the project of social justice or, in fact, prevent it from becoming hostage to dominant and politically powerful groups remains an open question. So, universal citizenship was the default notion of citizenship under the Constitution, with group differentiated citizenship 
presented as a temporary exception necessitated by the legitimate demands of social justice. Over time, however, and in a curious throwback to the, colonial, to the late colonial era, inverting the constitutional principle, group differentiated citizenship now appears to have become the dominant mode of citizenship, serving to revive and reinforce the colonial argument that Indian society is little more than a community of communities. This was the argument that the colonial state gave against the possibility of an Indian citizenship. It was an argument that nationalists resented at the time, but today the popular acceptance of the idea that it is appropriate for citizenship to be mediated by community sits well with intellectual suspicion of civic identity as a dubious legacy of modernity and nationalism. The problem remains a variant of the one that the philosopher Rousseau identified when he said, we have physicists, geometricians, chemists, astronomers, poets, musicians, and painters in plenty, but we have no longer a citizen among us. The idea of citizenship typically characterizes uh, the relationship between citizen and state, but also that amongst and between citizens. In contemporary uh, India, both of these um, are unstable relationships, and I will close with a few words about each of these. The relationship between the citizen as a rights holder and the state as the guarantor of rights is far from straightforward. Amid the celebration about the new slew of rights legislation, the troubling question remains, what does it mean for a citizen to hold a right that sanctifies a claim on the state when the responsibility for the actual provision of what it takes for that right to be realized lies elsewhere. As the provider of the good that that right guarantees is frequently no longer the state, but a variety of non-state agencies. An unintended consequence of independent India's attempts at providing inclusive citizenship through positive discrimination has been the marking of citizens in particular ways as beneficiaries, labeled objects of special provision scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and so on, to which was added an additional set of markers in the 1990s to help better target people for programs of poverty reduction. And these were groups marked B below poverty line or BPL, which yielded another category of those who were not below poverty line, APL or above poverty line, and a third category for those who were even lower than below poverty line, that is, Antyodaya or the destitute. Both, uh, both sets of markers, whether you know, the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe kind or the BPL, APL kind, were intended to render citizens uh, legible, to use James Scott's words, for the better implementation by the state of its policies of inclusion. And both have ironically, uh, perhaps unintentionally, tended to entrench exclusion. So the access of members of these groups to the substantive attributes of the real citizen is through these markers. However, their citizenship is rendered qualitatively different from, arguably even inferior to, the real citizenship of the unmarked citizen. When services for the poor, such as public health and public education, become, as they inevitably do, poor services, they too are stigmatized as inferior. But as we saw in relation to the doctrine of backwardness, the greater the back backwardness, the greater the entitlements that flow from it, there are ways in which inferiority can actually be valorized and even sanitized of all negative connotations. As far as the other relationship is concerned between and among citizens themselves, the expansion of rights has been simultaneously celebrated and resisted. The middle classes, recently empowered by the economic reforms, do not display and have had the civic solidarity that has to underwrite redistributive initiatives that are entailed by social rights. Moreover, in an atmosphere where competing identity claims cover a very large part of the surface area of everyday politics, there is some anxiety about the fragmentation and the fragility of the civic project and the fear that the possibility of, of um, articulating a shared common purpose for the polity, for the political community as a whole may be an aspiration that is unattainable. On the one hand, there is a creeping majoritarian impulse um, reflected in the laws and rules of citizenship. There are other creeping majoritarian impulses as well, as we all know, uh, on the horizon. Uh, but I'm just referring to the ones in the rules and uh, laws of citizenship. On the other, 
there is a reluctance of the political class to take ownership for the idea of a civic community because such an idea does not seem to have any apparent electoral constituency. It is not clear whether a civic community which transcends and escapes boxes and labels is any longer even, even an appealing social goal. In intellectual circles, of course, the post-national imagination precludes such an appeal in any case. So the combination of social intolerance and weak civic solidarity seem to signal an erosion of the constitutional vision of citizenship. Um, recent citizens' mobilizations on issues of corruption, sexual violence, legal reform, have generated some optimism about the performative aspects of Indian citizenship. I don't deal with it in this book, but these, ca these campaigns admittedly do signal a new um, citizen engagement amongst social groups which were up until now not politically active or politically engaged. But I find it difficult to detect in them, to see in them, the seeds of a substantive social transformation which would require on the one hand, sensitivity to the diversity and the plurality of Indian society, but also to poverty and inequality as challenges to a political community of equal citizens. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, <coughs> thank you. Um, this was obviously a terrific uh, summary of, uh, of the book and presentation of its major themes. <coughs> as I said in my introduction, um, I think this is a really terrific book. I want to note that I come to these comments as uh, a dilettante about both citizenship ideas and uh, Indian uh, constitutionalism. When I say dilettante, I, mean, I don't mean that I don't know anything about it, but uh, that I've read superficially and have had some thoughts about each of these topics, but with nowhere near the sophistication uh, that uh, someone who was a student of either field citizenship studies or uh, Indian uh, political and constitutional arrangements would have. Um, the book is rich along very many dimensions, and I'm going to talk, just briefly say something about two of them before turning to an, what, an embarrassingly narrow approach uh, that I, I it's generated by my own concerns as a lawyer. Uh, and then I'll conclude with a question uh, about something that uh, occurs early in the book and, but was not, I think, uh, part of the uh, main presentation. Um, so the first observation about the richness of the book is that it's a detailed account of how, in a real-world setting, citizenship is disaggregated, that there are, uh, that for any, this is overstated, but for any individual in the society, there are chunks of citizenship that are associated with different other citizens in the society. Uh, so there is a universalist strain, uh, there is a group differentiated uh, citizenship strain, there's access to uh, social and economic rights, and those are going to be um, allocated differently with respect to with large numbers of individuals. Um, so, and, and just the explication of this disaggregation seems to me uh, extremely valuable. Um, second, <clears throat> the account shows how uh, citizenship is nonlinear in a couple of senses. Uh, one is that there, there's uh, we're, that with respect to particular aspects, at least uh, one can identify uh, changes uh, that don't have the effect of sort of being a ratchet, so that. Uh, it, you know, s s the quality of citizenship goes up in some sense and then, then does not retrogress. Um, the, the language of retrogression is a little tricky here, but the account of the development and changes in the valence of citizenship by birth versus citizenship by uh, blood, uh, use sanguinous, 
um, is, is an example of this and, and uh, not so incidentally, shows a combination of two features. One, how the, how the developments in this are affected by political circumstances. Uh, po I describe them as political, the, the, such as the uh, uh, cross-border uh, migration from Bangladesh, or a series of case studies where people sort of in some sense end up on the wrong side of the line when partition occurs, although defining wrong is precisely what's at issue in this case. Um, uh, but there's another, there's also another uh, dimension of the, uh, the non-linearity. Uh, and this is uh, that um, early in the book, uh, there's a discussion or and, and in some ways an organizing theme in the book, uh, uh, of T.H. Marshall's uh, categories of civil, political, and social rights. And it's reasonably clear that for Marshall, or at least in the way Marshall has been assimilated into scholarly discourse, um, that categorization was, as I've put it, linear and historical. That is, people started out with no rights, then they got civil rights, and then they got political rights, and then they got social rights, and at the end, everybody has all of these categories. Um, I think in, in several uh, ways, uh, uh, the book shows that this linear progression just doesn't occur. And I think the most dramatic example, the most striking example, is the ethnographic discussion about Rajasthan, uh, where uh, the, the third category, at least in Marshall's uh, conceptualization, social rights, just displaces the uh, second political category. The political um, category is just not of interest to the uh, people in Rajasthan. Okay, so that's, that's an indication of some of the things that I find really quite uh, exciting about the book. My narrow lawyer's uh, concern deals with the development of social and economic rights. <clears throat> and uh, I think here's how I would, in a very caricatured kind of way, recast this, this story uh, in India. Um, Early on, the rights are, social and economic rights are set out as directive principles of its social policy in the Indian, its public policy in the Irish Constitution and social policy in the Indian one. Um, and these are understood as being probably not subject to judicial enforcement, although it's a matter of technical interest to me that in the Irish Constitution, the provision says these are not to be justiciable in any court, whereas the Indian provision doesn't say that. Uh, so, okay. Um, so it start, but it starts out with a notion that these are aspirational, uh, uh, and there are concerns about, on the one hand, the aspirations will be meaningless without any kind of enforcement. Uh, on the other, that enforcement would be intrusive, well, meaningless in two senses. One, without any enforcement, but also in a, a, a con the context of a, a, a poor society. Uh, and then any enforcement would be intrusive, both in terms of affecting state budgets and uh, interfering with the sort of ordinary modes of political, uh, uh, political decision making. Uh, now, what happened over the decades uh, the book describes the story of what happened in India, uh, but what happened over the dec decades were, were um, two um, developments in what I think of as uh, the technology of governance. Um, the first is pretty simple and uh, probably was there sort of nascently uh, at the outset. Um, the, the concern about uh, drains on state budgets uh, got, um, got described or got um, 
inscribed in constitutional documents by a formulation that, uh, uh, by words that take various forms, uh, but in the South African Constitution, it's within available resources. So now, once you have uh, the idea that these are rights, but they are to be guaranteed within available resources, you can start thinking of them as at least potentially justiciable, where the court would be sensitive both to the right and to the available resources part. Uh, so that's a conceptual uh, development. Um, the second, de second development was a, a real innovation, uh, which is the development of what I've called weak forms of judicial review. Uh, these forms involve sort of interactions, iterated interactions between the courts and the legislatures. Uh, and w once you develop that kind of idea, again, uh, judicial enforcement of social and economic rights, um, it, the, the concern about judicial enforcement uh, as interfering with state budgets and so on um, is reduced. It doesn't go away, but it's reduced uh, in a way that allows the courts to be more, uh, uh, more active in these uh, areas. Uh, and I would note, incidentally, that uh, it's a matter of, I think, it's a matter of current scholarly. It, yes. Scholars who think about these things probably ought to be examining the ways in which these iterated interactive forms of review could be coordinated with things like privatization and outsourcing of government processes, uh, government um, uh, uh, um, Lock of powers. Uh, it's it's not a, it's not obvious at the outset uh, that outsourcing and the like would be incompatible with uh, enforcement of social and economic rights, at least in this iterated interactive kind of model. Um, now, I, there, there are uh, uh, limitations on, on this model uh, which are worth noting, again, from a, uh, one is not from a lawyer's point of view, one, that these things work uh, under uh, certain kinds of conditions, uh, degree of competence in the, the, the policy makers, uh, and a willingness in, in to, to engage in the interactions. Um, and they are uh, undermined by uh, corruption. Uh, and so these techniques have to be, you have to think about how these techniques will fit into the larger uh, system. Um, uh, and, and a final point is, is this. Uh, all forms of uh, judicial enforcement of rights uh, are, can be understood only in connection with the Constitution's amendment rules. Uh, just the crude version is if you have, a, a, if you have a, a Constitution that is difficult to amend, then when the courts say something, it's basically you're stuck with it as a constitutional rule. Uh, India has uh, a notoriously, it's not the easiest in the world, but it's a notoriously easy amendment process. Uh, and how that process is going to interact with judicial enforcement is quite interesting in, in the area of social and economic rights. In the area of, of um, reservations and quotas, the interaction has been uh, quite straightforward. The courts say things and the, the parliament responds by amending the constitution to deny what the court just said. Um, whether that will occur or to the degree to which it will occur with respect to social and economic rights is interesting. Um, the story about food security and the right to work is that the legislatures have been pushed along uh, by the courts. Um, okay, so that, that's my substantive comment. The, the, it, it is relatively narrow. The question I want to pose, and this is, gives you an opportunity to talk beyond the allotted 
time on something that you didn't talk about, is, is this. Um, early in the book, you talk about the idea of citizenship regimes. And for the basic notion is that there are these three categories and there are these three periods. And if you look at how each category is treated in each period and then assemble them, you get the regime for that period. Uh, and uh, you talk about that early in the book and then it, it more or less disappears from the book. And so I, I would like to, I mean, I have my own reaction to that, but I would like you to talk about the idea of citizenship regimes as you deal with it in the book. Should I respond first? Yeah. I yeah, no, I think a, a few minutes of response and then people can be thinking of questions. And Thank you for those very rich comments. Uh, is this on? Is it on now? Right, okay, thank you. Um, so let me start with the uh, earlier comments you made, which are uh, fantastic there. Um, you know, uh, about the weak forms of judicial review and the iterated interaction between courts and legislatures, I have yet to read your book on it. I've just picked it up. But um, I mean, I'll be thinking in terms of recasting this is issue as one of a, as a sort of separation of powers question, um, because there have been some arguments made, uh, not by me, but by others, about how the court is only, uh, is, is interfering too little rather than too much uh, with uh, the executive slash legislature in a parliamentary form of government. As you know, it's harder to make that distinction. Um, and it's interfering too little in the sense that it simply holds the executive to account for what the executive had, has said it will do, but not actually done rather than pushing open and prizing open those spaces uh, a little more uh, to, in fact, do the kinds of things that, uh, to some extent, have been attempted through the right to food uh, uh, orders, the interim orders, uh, though not actually accomplished mm -hmm. in the, uh, the, the, uh, the legislation that we now have, which is far from a right to food, uh, as we know. It's just a you know, Food Security uh, Act. Uh, so, so is this really a separation of powers question? Is it a question of what it is right and proper, how much it is right and proper for, for, for courts to do, um, uh, especially given the point you raised at the very, at almost at the very end, which was really interesting, which is about the amendment procedure. I hadn't thought of that. That the amendment procedure and the fact that courts and uh, on many issues, such as the Shabanu judgment, the uh, divorce for Muslim women and so on, on those sorts of issues, the legislature has regularly, and in fact with reservations and quotas, has regularly over, uh, um, has, has regularly made enactments which in fact override what the judiciary has pronounced. So, so, um, so I, I, I need to understand this a little better. The uh, second point that you made, which was about um, how outsourcing and so on of public goods could be compatible with social and economic rights in that model, uh, raises to my mind only one question, which is that of accountability. Who is accountable uh, to whom? Uh, who are, uh, if citizens have a right on the state, is that right transferable? Are there mechanisms of accountability that make it possible for the delivery of those services to be delivered in a way that includes and encompasses some principle of accountability to citizens uh, to whom these services are to be provided? So what would the, the sort of the mechanism or the chain of accountability look like in that sort of model. So it's not just a question of getting outcomes uh, of delivery, but it's also a question of being uh, of, of somebody being accountable. So who in that scenario would be accountable uh, is, is, of course, the question that remains. Um, as far as citizenship regimes are concerned, yes, I mean, that is a very important point. Um, and I'm afraid I did let go of it a bit. Um, and I have not, uh, I, I guess it was fatigue more than anything else by the end of, by the, end of the book. Uh, but it is something to which I uh, propose to return. I haven't done so yet, but it is something to which I propose to return. Uh, but you had some comments on it, and I would be very grateful for them. Uh, well, just two things uh, on, on my, this, my comments on social and economic rights. I, I do think there are two observations about that. One, I do think that 
the idea of these weak forms of review is an effort to dissipate concerns about separation of powers. Um, and, and second, um, I ha it is within these forms, actually, in any form of review, it is possible to construct your legal doctrine so as to provide account, a judicial doctrine, independent of what the policymakers do, a judicial doctrine that does provide for a judicial form of accountability in outsourcing. Um, it's a complicated argument, and uh, some courts sort of have seen it, uh, but it's not, uh, I, mean, I, was, I, I think it's clearly right, but it's not something that's been um, deeply embedded in sort of constitutional uh, interpretations around the world. Uh, on the citizenship regimes, actually, I, you know, I don't want to press you on this, uh, partly because I'm not sure that it's right, actually, that um, the notion that there is some sort of coherence among the three categories at any particular period seems to me in some tension with the, the overall idea of disaggregation. Um, maybe it's just that's what happened to be what was going on in the sort of nonlinear development of each of these categories. Um, so I'm sort of skeptical about the idea of, of it. Uh, and I thought you were early on as well. I, but, yeah, I just sort of let it go, as you rightly said. I, mm -hmm. I forgot all about it till, oh. this, till this minute. <laughs> okay, so now uh, questions or comments? Yes. Could I link Peter Kerzenstein from Cornell? Nigel, could I link in that very question? I haven't read the book, but I skimmed the introduction. I listened to, to the comments. I find the concept of citizenship regime very attractive. And I'm asking whether, in fact, you have an evolutionary argument built into it, and I reject that, but I come back to it because of the title of the book. So in one way, it's tennis from status to contract, right? The third category for your third period, identity, plays itself out whenever status and contract interact in a certain way. So I read the setup of the book as a three by three, mm -hmm. three time periods, three concepts, in which you privilege status for the first period, rights for the second, and identity for the third, but you're not in fact equating them. You're just playing them down for presentational purposes, arguing the first period there's status, but of course rights and identity play into it. In the third period there's identity, but of course status and rights play into that in the second period as well. That conception of citizenship regime could then travel to Europe, to the United States, to Latin America, Asia, other parts of Asia, Africa, because the configuration would be different, but the building blocks would be identical. So I know the European discussion somewhat, the American discussion somewhat, and I think your building, your building blocks are not distinctly Indian, but the configuration might be. Okay. So I like that idea because it takes you, takes the analytics of the book, and it makes them travel. Now, ending up in rights and giving it a loyalty uh, uh, a court inflected interpretation makes this seem very Western. If you look at the debates in China, that's not where they are. It's not about human rights. The debate there is about human dignity. So the subtype that the evocation of Freud in fact invokes a civilizational argument cast in citizenship terms, which is universalist. And that undercuts the structure, the basic structure of the argument. So What's striking to me is that you, in, you can, in fact, engage directly without any inhibition Western contract theory and, and constitutional theory. That would be very different if you were in Korea, Japan, or in China. So in this sense, India is not Asia. India is somewhere inflected towards the West, but also part of Asia. And arguing with Freud that there is a civilization, in this case, citizenship, universalism lurking, strikes me as implausible. We have a language now in the world by which we can disagree. This is a huge advance forward. But to cast it in terms of this is the language of rights will make India parochial just as the West is. Thank you, Peter. That's an awful lot of questions. Um, Turn the mic up, please. The, um, 
as a domino. Um, the last point you made um, about, well, first of all, I mean, is Asia not a construct as well? You know, whose idea of Asia anyway? And what does it encompass? So that is itself a construct. But I don't think the point here is to, to place, uh, not for me at any rate, is to place India in Asia or anywhere else, uh, in the West or maybe just broadly the non-West. Um, so but that's, uh, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, on the question of the building blocks, there was one other comment in between which I seem to have forgotten in this business of switching on and off the mic. Um, is it off the mic? I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Peter, if you just remind me what the second one was. No, 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 I, I wanted to answer that. Um, it was about rights. Yeah, so about dignity and, and China and India. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, dignity is very much a part of uh, the Indian discourse as well. Uh, ideas of dignity, humiliation, and so on are very much and are very much aligned to ideas of discrimination, and they do fall, broadly speaking, within the identity section of the book. So it's not that uh, that it's one or the other. They are both present simultaneously, which in fact goes back to Professor Tushnet's earlier comment about non-linearity, um, or, or in fact about disaggregation. So, so I don't see a problem there in accommodating both the idea of rights as well as the idea of dignity as different types of claims to different types of citizenship or different aspects of citizenship. I don't see that problem. As far as the building blocks and the, and the three by three table you gave us, um, actually, I would not argue that any one of these three dimensions is dominant in each of the three periods. Uh, the, um, the status aspect is, for obvious reasons, uh, not so important in the first period, the late colonial period, but both the rights and the identity <coughs> aspects are. And uh, in the post-independence period, all three of them are simultaneously in play. Uh, I would not put each one of these into a particular period in, in that kind of uh, three by three box. Um, Just one, one comment on, to the extent that anyone is interested in exploring the difference between China and India with the notion of uh, dignity at work, there's a very large literature in comparative constitutional law about comparative US and European notions of dignity. Um, I don't want to say that there's any conclusions in them, but if that issue is to be explored, and particularly if, if uh, India is somehow to be associated with a Western kind of orientation, that literature probably needs to be engaged. Uh, again, with the observation that it's not clear that there is a, given the differences between the US and Europe, that there is a Western approach to it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Siri uh, Dopen, I'm from Norway, in Westerberg. Thank you both. Uh, I have um, a question first. I think, um, I was just, I mean, India is so vast and it's so diverse. And I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to read the book yet, but I'm, I'm wondering about how the different trajectories of discourse around citizenship vary in, 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 different, in the different regions or different states. Really. With the, 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 the status of material state citizenship situation is very different in different parts of the country. And do you see that as a sort of a resulting from different ideological uh, and different trajectories for the way that citizenship has developed, or different citizenship regimes, if you want. Um, and then I was also sort of, I wanted to just follow up a little bit on the discussion about enforcement of rights in the context of, of um, taxation or deregulation. And I was, I was just curious of sort of, uh, I was thinking it, what you said reminded me of, on the one hand, horizontal application of rights, as we've seen in the South African context, and then on the other hand, of, the way in which, for instance, the Colombian Constitutional Court has enforced health rights in the context of private health providers, but with a constitutional uh, guarantee. So I was just, 
I was just curious about sort of how uh, is that a type of, of um, mechanism that you that you envision could be sort of also applied in the new first okay. Um, hi, Siri. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't. Uh, uh, the um, question of regions is important, obviously, uh, on both the social rights front as well as the identities front. Uh, it is. It's only the uh, the legal status thing which has a, a, a almost entirely exclusively national. Uh, uh, framework, though there are exceptions in the regions, and so you have, you know, the uh, politics in Assam around the immigration issue of Bangladeshis and so on. Similarly, Rajasthan, and, and legal exceptions are made from time to time. But other than that, the other two issues are do translate locally and differently. Uh, there's no question about that. I obviously haven't done that in this book at all, but uh, but I, I mean, I think on the social rights front uh, or the social welfare front, if you like, rather than rights. Uh, it has been a combination of some initially populist policies in some states, uh, which have then uh, uh, triggered political mobilization around uh, social welfare uh, and better delivery. So some states are better at delivering s public services. Uh, some states have invented, for instance, Tamil Nadu invented the idea of the midday meal scheme. Um, uh, you know, so which then was taken up by the national government in order to keep children in school. That was not the original reason for it. Uh, but, uh, but so, you know, th these are locally translated very differently. And politics and political mobilization, I would say, are very important uh, uh, factors there. As far as identities are concerned, they too translate locally, though you can also see regional patterns, uh, sort of UP Bihar, for instance, uh, you know, one sort of formation at uh, more or less proximate uh, moments in time, and, and, and uh, you do see regional patterns. But yes, there are uh, state-level conflicts. Uh, for instance, the issue of sub-quotas translates very differently between um, Nagaland on the one hand and Andhra Pradesh on the other. Uh, so, but the fact that there are demands for sub-quotas in many states is uh, is common to them, almost all of them, is common to all of them. And that's why you have state backward classes commissions which actually arbitrate these demands and these claims uh, based on identity and try and figure out which one is, uh, is a valid claim and which one is not, and then calibrate the policy accordingly or admit more people to the quota, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, but, but that, in a sense, is a, is, is a shared feature uh, that most states uh, exhibit. Uh, even though the actual form in which it translates regionally and locally may differ from one to the other. And just, just briefly, yeah, yes, I, the doctrine I was in mind was the hard uh, effect doctrine. And in, in the book that uh, was referred to, I have a little section on how that works out. Okay, we, uh, we have a couple more questions, and then we'll probably have to break. So. You said that um, the dominant mode of citizenship in India today has shifted from the universalist model to the group differentiated model, and that in many ways this harkens back to the colonial period when the notion of communitarian Indians was used to deny the right to self determination. Right? Um, so in, in the colonial period, there is this hierarchy that's established between the the ability to embody a form of civic universalism, which was not extended to Indians, and the sort of communitarian mentality of Indians. Now, I don't, I don't actually see what's happening in India today as a return to that model. In fact, I, um, what I see is that this group differentiated model of citizenship actually sets up a more dialectical relationship between sort of communitarian particularism and civic universalism, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's precisely through claims on the basis of group rights that civic universalism has been made more substantive, right? And that the parameters of civic universalism universalism has actually been expanded to include new groups. So I wonder if you could mm -hmm. uh, yeah. comment on whether you see these things as actually opposed or 
in kind of a more dialectical relationship. Yeah. I mean, as I started out by saying that both principles have a deep moral appeal. I think the question is that of balance. Uh, and there is a need to strike a balance between the civic universalist and the particularistic uh, uh, differentiated. Uh, so, you know, there are uh, group differentiated citizenship has uh, tremendous value and moral appeal both. Uh, and it is important. Social justice cannot be accomplished without it, clearly. However, it is uh, what I have tried to argue here is that there are dangers of the balance being shifted so far in the direction of group differentiatedness that you actually lose the idea of the civic altogether. Where does the idea of the civic reside at all? If all is particularity, uh, you know, where might the idea of a civic community exist? And I, I see few signs of that, and I see signs of the balance shifting, uh, weighting down, weighing down on the other side of group differentiatedness, um, and uh, with with the with a very thin notion of the civic remaining. That's that's my concern. But uh, but uh, you'll have to read the book to be able to, uh, you know. So I I, I I obviously do not reject the idea of group differentiated rights. I mean I welcome them. But on the other hand, I think it is important that a balance be struck in a polity, otherwise you can't have a political community. And, and I think we are in danger of, um, of overbalancing the boat in a certain, in a certain direction. That's, that's the and this has to be the last question, I'm afraid. Um, I'm Mary Katz, I'm the government department at Cornell. Well, I, I think my questions follow very much along this incredibly nuanced um, dialectic that you do bring out in the book, and yet Mark Tushin made a, you know, has commented about the linearity part. I mean, he made a, more as a comment than a question. And so my, I want to draw up on this sort of linearity issue, but really as a question. And it's a question in two parts. I mean, one is that you do offer a bottom line, which is that there is a, dis, um, a sort of demotion of civic solidarity and of universalism. And that is the bottom line after this very complex and um, in the area that um, analysis, but I really wonder about that. I mean, if you know, if I hark back to vociferous tendencies, or there are just so many periods of mm -hmm. Indian history where you could, or post-independence Indian history, where you could say this this um, pull away from the civic universalism was so rampant. So that's that. Sort of my question is, how how do we know that there really is this shift away or shift downwards? And the second part of the question is. If we were to look for universalism or civic solidarity, where would we most expect to find it? I mean, if, if we have a sort of hunch that, that there's a possibility of it, where, where would you expect to find it? I mean, I, I think of it as sort of the Nehruvian elite universal solidarity that will not ever return in the same form. So where would one uh, of the past, and that's, you know, that has dispersed, and, and has been vegan. But where would we now expect to find it? Mm. The second part of the question is really tough. I, I have to think about that. But the first part of the question, yes, I mean, I agree with you that there were, there were phases in Indian post-independence history when uh, fissiparous tendencies were evident in terms of regional demands and so on, of, you know, not quite secession, but in some cases also greater autonomy and secession. Those remain, by the way. They haven't gone away. But I think the ones that I'm concerned about more are, uh, are, are those which are cast along non-regional lines, uh, cast being one of them. But the really interesting polarity or the really interesting dynamic that I see emerging now is between, on the one hand, this sort of fragmentation, which is evident, by the way, in election patterns, among other things, because what are national elections today but an aggregation of state level uh, election verdicts. They are people are voting not on a national register. That is evident from all the election studies that we read today, right? The people are not voting in a national register necessarily. They're always voting, even in a parliamentary election, voting on a regional register and voting for parties. Yeah, so, I mean, so to the extent that national level elections are an aggregation of state level verdicts, that is one area where one might be able to look to answer, the, you know, possibly the second question, though I'm not 100% uh, certain of where else one could, one could look to answer that. Uh, but, 
but the, um, sorry, I lost track of the fissiparous tendencies thing. So, so there are these other forms. Uh, they don't necessarily have to take the forms of demands for regional autonomy, though those exist. Uh, Kashmir, Manipur, these, are, these remain uh, difficult uh, areas and their claims remain uh, exactly where they were, uh, you know, 10 years ago or more. But, sorry, once again I've lost uh, what I was, um, the, um, sorry Mary, I've actually forgotten what I was just going to say. No, the, uh, the Fisip, no, 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 I want to come back to, give me a minute. Uh, the Fisipairus tendencies uh, that you, yeah. So, so the, the really, the worrying thing that I see is that on the one hand you have uh, the possibility of a return to Hindu majoritarian politics and on the other hand, you have this sort of fragmentation along lines of caste and so on. And what worries me is the possibility that the religious majoritarian consolidation might be what is, uh, what is uh, marshaled and commandeered to trump this other caste-based fragmentation. And that's the worry that I see going forward. I mean, I don't know if this makes sense to you, but. Uh, but if there is a possibility of a right-wing majoritarian, Hindu majoritarian polity uh, appearing, that could become a powerful argument and an alarming argument for trumping all the other forms of fragmentation that we are seeing. So that's a scenario that I worry about. Okay, I'm, af I'm afraid we have to uh, conclude this uh, session. I want to thank Professor Jael for coming and uh, for giving such a stimulating talk. And I personally want to thank the South Asia Institute for inviting me to uh, uh, chair this uh, discussion because uh, it uh, prodded me to read the book, which uh, the odds are I would not have done otherwise. And I, it's, a, it's a terrific book, and I uh, commend it all to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.